presence today, and, and we have two of them, are first from Revelation and then from Matthew's Gospel. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 17. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation, tribe, and people, and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a mighty shout, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings. And they all fell into the throne with their faces to the ground and worshipped God. They sang, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the twenty-four elders asked me, Who are these who are clothed in white? Where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun. For the Lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to the springs of life giving water. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. And from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, 1 to 12. One day, as Jesus saw the crowds gathering, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is there. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right for the kingdom of heaven is there. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted the same way. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thank you, God. God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and our minds that we may hear the joy of your word for us this day. And as we hear it, let it plant seed that will grow and bear fruit in our hearts, in our lives, in this church and beyond, now and forevermore. Amen. What do you think of when you think of saints? Maybe you think of the apostles who wrote gospels and led the church. Or maybe you think of the martyrs who died for the faith across the history of the church? Oh, maybe you think of contemporary saints like John Paul II and Mother Teresa. Or maybe you think about the classic saints we often talk about like Francis of Assisi or Patrick of Ireland. Well, you know, we don't really identify with those kind of saints who embrace the life of poverty and obedience of austerity. You know, saints like Julian of Norwich who spent years in her room all by herself in isolation praying until she heard the voice of Jesus say to her, and all will be well, and all will be well, and every manner of thing will be well. Or like Bridget, the saint from Ireland who disfigured herself, her face, so men would not find her attractive. We don't really identify with saints like that, even the contemporary ones. We don't identify with those lives of obedience and austerity. So, so preacher, can there be any other kind of saint? Yes, there are. And they are real people like you and me who live faithful lives every day to live for Jesus. The scriptures today are about saints. Maybe you didn't catch that when I was reading it, but in Revelation, John is describing the saints he saw in his vision in heaven. These were the saints who had come through the great tribulation. The reason they suffered and died was they remained faithful to God. Jesus in the Beatitudes is describing how saints live in this world. Notice he's talking about ordinary people. Merciful. Humble. Meek. Faithful. Persecuted. He described all of these things as how saints really live in our world. 
Saints are ordinary people like you and me. Maybe you haven't thought about it that way. But remember what Paul said to the people in Corinth? He called them saints. Can you think of anybody that's more ordinary and less likely to be a saint than that crowd in Corinth? But Paul said, ordinary people like you and me who live lives that are faithful, who live as God's people. J.B. Phillips said that saints are men and women for God. God's men, God's women. Simple as that. Faithfulness. So, so, so what are saints, real saints, really like? What characterizes them? How do you know? Uh, first of all, they love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. You've heard that before. But for saints, the reason they do that is they have experienced God's presence and love in their life in a way that made a difference. And now they want to show that love. They want to give it back to God. And the only way you can love God back is to do what? Love everybody. John reminds us in his epistle, you cannot love God if you don't love your neighbor, everybody. And so it's really about being loving. It's not about being like somebody, being compared to somebody. It's about being loved. There was a man that went to a pastor in town where he lived, and he said, my brother has just died. I know my brother was a scoundrel. He had a terrible reputation. He did everything wrong, and he just lived a bad life. But if you could find a way to make him sound good at his funeral, I would greatly appreciate it. He said, I'll, I'll do the best I can. And so after reading scripture, he talks with him about him. And he said, you know, this man lived an awful life. You know, he was a scoundrel, a ne'er do well, but compared to his brother, he was the same. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You're not made saints because you think you're better than somebody else. You begin to be a saint because you love God and you let the love of God come in and through you. There were two sisters, one lived in the country, one lived in the city. And they would visit each other from time to time. But the one in the country went to visit her sister in the city and took her, her eight-year-old son with her. And they went to her sister's church, big church downtown in the city. Huge, beautiful stained glass windows. And the sun was beaming through the windows. And the little boy said to his mama, Mama, who are those people over there in the window? She said, well, son, they're the saints. Oh. A few weeks later at their little country church, the Sunday school teacher had to be all saints Sunday. His Sunday school teacher said, we're going to talk about saints today. Can anybody tell me what a saint is? The little boy raised his hand. The eight year old boy. She said, what's a saint? He said, they're the people that let the light shine through. That's right. The light of God's love shines through the lives of saints so that people can see the love of God in them. Saints begin with love. Love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love their neighbors as themselves. Saints know and love worship and study and prayer. Why? Because they know they need to be refreshed and renewed and inspired. And that's why they come. They, they make the effort to do it. L let, me, let me be clear on one thing. Coming to church or coming to a Bible study or attending a prayer meeting will not make you a saint. Okay? But you can't be one without doing it. It's a must. No athlete in the Olympics goes and performs on that day of the Olympics without having been trained before, spending time doing it. Saints know they need that. They need to be refreshed and renewed. It was only, and it's only been in the last half of the 20th century that we came up with the concept of being burnt out. And the reason we got burnt out, Gene Peterson said, is because we focus so much on the mechanics of running a church rather than on the fundamentals of being Christians serving God. Because if we were doing that, we, we would focus on the worship and prayer and study. We'd be renewed and refreshed together. It's important. There was a group of young boys that played together, enjoyed each other. They go over to one of their friend's house and they were coming out of the house to go to the park to play. And Granddad was sitting on the porch in a rocking chair with a Bible on his lap. One of the boys said to his friend, said, well, what's Grandpa doing? He said, oh, don't, don't worry about that. He's just cramping for finals. <laughs> well, it's more than that. Grandpa knew what was in that book, what a difference it made in his life. It wasn't just words on a page. 
or something to collect dust. It was, in fact, the Word of God that speaks to our very heart, our very mind, and our very need, our very soul. That's why when you read the Scriptures, the same ones over and over and over, you get fresh new insight. They come alive again and again and again. A thousand times, they're still fresh. It's a living Word. And so was that. Let me tell you something. We, we, I heard the phrase some years ago. Uh, from a television preacher talking about Christianity light. That's what the church has become. Christianity light is not Christianity. It cannot be. There is no light version, no diet version. <clears throat> it's all or none. And that means that you and I must be focused on the one who makes it happen in us, God. And being faithful to God means, means being faithful to those things and attending to them. How often do you pray? How often do you read scripture and pray over it? How often do you worship? Saints know how important it is, and they take every opportunity they can. I've often visited folks who were shut in or in a nursing home now, and I've heard them say, I cannot tell you how many times, I really wish I could go to church again. How much I miss it. We take it for granted. We don't think about it. But you know, when I've been sick on a Sunday and I wasn't able to be in church, even if I wasn't supposed to preach that Sunday, it was the most miserable week for me. I knew I missed something. I knew how important it was. Saints know how important it is. Finally, saints know that the way to love God is to serve others, even the least of these. You, you don't choose who you serve. You serve everybody equally. Because all are God's children made in God's image. And we love God by serving them in whatever capacity we can do it. Now you won't find his name in a stained glass window or on a brass plaque except in one place. You will find it in Jerusalem. His name is Shishun Sugihara. He was the Japanese ambassador to Poland in World War II. One of the things he learned when he got there, by the way, he was a Christian he went to a Christian school in Japan to study languages and converted and became a believer. He discovered that the Jews in Poland were trying to find a way to get out and get away from the Nazis. And the only way you could travel was to have a visa. So they were begging him for visas. He started writing visas. Sometimes staying up as long as 20 hours a day to write them. Even when the Japanese embassy pulled him out because he was violating their orders not to do it. Remember, they were part of the access with Nazis. On the train, as he was driving out, he was throwing them out the windows of the train to the crowd of Jews who were begging for him. It is said that he saved somewhere between six and 10,000 Jews for those visas. In 1978, when his widow, Yukoko, went to visit Jerusalem to receive an honor for her late husband, some of those Jews still had the faded yellow visas that saved their lives. You know what he said when he was asked, why did you do it? Because he said, I love God, and therefore I love God's people. And it was what I could do. It was what I could do. How we serve others it is an expression of how we love God. Because we show God that what matters to him matters to us too. They brought Albert Schweitzer to New York to receive an honor. They were at Grand Central Station, and the reporters had gathered and begun to ask the great doctor questions. All of a sudden, he said, would you excuse me just a moment, gentlemen, just, just excuse me for a moment. And he walked over, and there was a little black lady trying to struggle, struggling with her luggage, trying to get it to her car. Albert Schweitzer picked it up, carried it to her car, opened the door, put it in it, and said, have a nice day, madam. And she said, thank you, sir. And when he walked back, one of the reporters said, that's the first time in my life I've ever seen a sermon walking. He understood it. Saints are not otherly people. They're not somebody who's better than somebody else. Saints are ordinary. They're me and you. And we're called to be saints for God. People who are faithful, who are loving, who understand the importance of worship and fellowship. It may sound strange to you if you say it, that you and I are called to be saints, but we are. We are. And you know where our sainthood ought to begin? Right here at this table. Because this is the place where saints connect with the love of God in such a way that it always 
touches their hearts and their lives. And they never forget it. In fact, they live it forever. Even in eternity, we'll be around the throne, John says, worshiping and being again forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.